I'm going to trust that you can see my screen with the uh, the young lady. Fantastic. All right. We are going to talk about the advent of AI and what AI is doing to the future of education, not only as teachers and students, but when we look at jobs that will be available for those students. We want to make sure that the advent of AI is something that we embrace, something that we uh, uh, can appreciate, because it is going to be a student's way of of getting information going forward. So we really want students to be very aware of things and we want to learn some lessons from the past. So the presentation uh, is expected to go through the how, why, and what we teach because of the advent in AI. I am Kevin Combs. I'm with learning.com. I'm the state program manager for South Carolina. Uh, the only people that I interact with are the South Carolinians. Um, we do have this product available for all districts, all teachers, and all students, grade K through eight within the state of South Carolina. So we're glad that you're already using us. I do appreciate you. And we hopefully will uh, come to a consensus together that the computer science is such a vital part of the landscape of education in today's world that we want to start bringing it into the classroom, not just through specials or just through time set aside for computer science, but instead look at ways that we can incorporate computer science principles in those everyday activities we're doing in ELA already, in math, in history, in science. So we're really going to explore that. And my hope is through this uh, through this presentation that we will touch on all these points and be able to build that strong case. Uh, first, we're going to talk about when we say AI, sometimes it's a misnomer. So we're going to really dive into what we're talking about when we're talking about AI. And then we're going to talk about how technology is driving our workforce. And as our workforce gets uh, more and more technically oriented, uh, are we given those technology soft skills that are necessary for our students? When we look at this newfangled AI explosion, it's very akin to the explosion of social media and that connectedness that we had. So we want to learn some lessons from social media. Uh, we did a lot of stuff with social media very quickly. And as a result with that, we've learned lessons on what it's done for the unintended consequences of social media. I uh, want to take a second and just let you, uh, I do recognize we do have a couple of new attendees, too. I see Mr. Floyd Dinkins and uh, Miss Bowers from Orangeburg. Uh, welcome to the two of y'all. We are just going into the very beginning, going over our agenda of what today is. And uh, just to back up real quick, this is uh, we're taking AI and we're taking a broad look at it. Uh, in, in, in respect to what it's going to do for educators, it's going to do for the students, and what it's going to do for futures and jobs. And we're going to accomplish that by going through AI and the technology and the workforce and those lessons from social media. And that caught you up to where uh, Mr. Mesh and I were. Um, we're now preparing today's learners for tomorrow's jobs. And that's something that we've always had in mind. You know, I take uh, advice from Stephen Covey. We begin with the end in mind. And hopefully the end that we all can, uh, can see for our students is once they walk across the stage after their senior year, that we have prepared them to be productive members of society where they are now capable of being able to provide a, a family lifestyle that uh, maybe they didn't have before. So that's kind of the end in mind. So we're going to prepare those students to be ready to um, participate in tomorrow's jobs. We'll then go through uh, time. Uh, we have time to we can explore AI and some of the powerful tools that you might not be familiar with. And we can really look at how you can currently use AI to drive some of the lessons that you're already doing in your school. If it's not just like a, a computer science standalone class, we can look at how we can integrate that into other subjects. And then I want to make sure that you're very well with the Palmetto Digital Literacy Program, which everyone in this region is already an active member. Um, we want to make sure that you understand what all is included in that, how to access it, how to leverage it, how to get additional training, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to make sure that, <clears throat> excuse me, that you're comfortable with uh, the Palmetto Digital Literacy, which is learning.com for all students in South Carolina, grades K through eight. All right. So to get us started, we're going to define what AI is for the purposes of our conversation. 
you know, we've had AI around us for years, and we maybe have never really designated it as AI. But when you look at the Siri, when you're doing your iPhone, if you have uh, an Alexa in your uh, in your house, if you happen to own a Tesla, they have the ability to do autonomous driving, these things. So artificial intelligence in respect to machines doing things for us and taking the place of human thought has happened for about 10 years now. But really, we're talking with this new push of AI, we're really talking about large language models. We're talking about chat GPT and the equivalent programs for um, BARD, which is Google side. The uh, Microsoft uh, has a, a function built into its Edge browser when you're doing searches through their um, search system. And then obviously, OpenAI is the owner of ChatGPT and we have them. Um, so I'm just going to refer to everything for AI as chat GPT. We're going to use them interchangeably. Even though I technically know that's not correct, I think it'll help us kind of streamline and uh, keep a good focus on what we're talking about today. Now, when we think of AI, there's always the, the best case scenario. The best case scenario is the founder of, of OpenAI said, it's one of those technologies that comes along and it has the ability to massively increase our quality of life. And that is truly what we hope for most technology. However, there are many drawbacks that we have learned that we need to be very keenly aware of. Uh, a second, Arthur C. Clarke says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Well, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about myself. I am the kid that when my parents took me to a magic show, I'm always following the the hand that he is not bringing our attention. I'm trying to bust the magician in all aspects of his magic show. That is just who I am. And I believe a lot of our students are like that too. They appreciate the fact that that's a good magic show, but I really think they want to understand but I'm going to take it a step further. I think they really need to understand this undistinguishable from magic piece, which is that technology. I'm going to do that with a quick little uh, diagram. So what we're used to doing when we use a program like ChatGPT, we put a, a query in the input. We're going to ask it to do something for us. Well, that hidden layer, that is where all of the algorithms live and all of the trained models are going and reviewing tons and tons of data that has already been archived. And it is going to produce us an output layer. So for the majority of us, we see two pieces. We see what it is that we input and we see what it outputs. But the magic that is going on is in that hidden layer. And here is the problem with that hidden layer being like magic. Because we're going to put something in as an input and we're going to get something out as an output, we're going to have to make the assumption that what magic happened is correct, that there's no bias in that magic, that there is no misinformation in that magic, that there is uh, a way that we can actually go and look at some sort of legitimate publication to verify and back up the claims that are made up in that output. The more people that we have impacting that hidden magic layer, the more voices that we have impacting that magic layer, the more truthful the outputs that we will get will be from now until infinity. So we're at that point in time in which we're building the ship as we're flying it. So let's go ahead and get as many people on that airplane as possible so that they can have input as to how comfortable that ride should be and how much leg room they, they should need and how wide they need the seats to be. Because without their voice, it is going to be decided upon by a very few a very elite group, a very well-educated group, but we can also make the assumption that that group is going to have a collective conscience in which they are going to promote a lot of their viewpoints in that hidden layer. We need to make sure everybody's viewpoints are coming in that hidden layer. So that is our task. That is our challenge. Now, I'm going to use the second uh, piece of information just to reiterate how quickly ChatGPT has become part of, of our world. Across the bottom, you see the number of days that it took for these different technologies to reach 100 million users. 
um, going all the way to the furthest one to the right, which is Netflix, it was about 3,500 days. You know, there's 365 days in a year. That is almost 10 years that it took Netflix, which is everywhere, to get to 100 million users. Facebook and Twitter took a considerable left almost half of the time when you start talking about things like Spotify and Facebook, about a quarter of the time when you look at Instagram. But when you look at the line, then it's almost completely horizontal, I mean, completely vertical. That's chat GPT. It took three days for 100 million users to sign up, get on, and utilize chat GPT. A brand new technology is in the hands of over 100 million people in three days, and they're currently using it. To me, that is alarming because there is no proof of concept. There is no uh, regulation on it. It is almost as if Wikipedia can now give you an answer because we don't know where this information is coming from. We tell them, or we've been told it is trained on millions and millions of pages of uh, data. But was it data that they got from Twitter? Was it data that they got from uh, Hezbollah? I mean, there, there could be thousands of places where all of this information came from. So the computer science piece of that Again, from a fundamental standpoint of, of Kevin Combs is that we need people to make sure that we have as many voices in that. This goes without saying as well, technology shapes industry. And I want to know if you would disagree or if you agree with the statement. Whenever we have those significant advances in technology, it doesn't just affect the practices that happen within an industry. It creates additional opportunities. It creates additional career paths as a result. So to put it short, technology can take jobs away by maybe automating some of the more mundane, repetitious jobs, and it can create new ones as a result. That is only if we're providing that the workforce that we have trained has a skill set that they can navigate that technology. Now. When we uh, when we talk about this, we're going to look at this in terms of what we're going to consider low skill jobs uh, in a lot of cases. So, with that being said, do you agree or do you disagree? Is industry or technology just taking away jobs, or is technology going to put as many jobs out there as it takes away? I'll be interested in hearing your thoughts on that. So if you'd like to unmute and, and give me your thoughts behind it, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll bring this more into a discussion than just a, a one-way presentation. I'll say that I agree with that statement. And I, and I was, was listening to NPR, they were talking about how with the new electric cars that we have, because they are so much heavier than traditional combustible engines, that they're having to develop new types of tires to go on these cars that won't run out as quickly. They're having to develop new types of asphalt or road surfaces to accommodate, especially if the big 18 wheeler trucks begin to go hybrid or electric. And so I think there were the electric car concept sounded good, but then when in practicality, it actually created a whole bunch of new opportunities that is a wonderful matter of fact, yes, or I'm sorry, not yesterday, but the day before we did the same presentation. And one of the uh, items that they brought up was the Tesla, the electric cars. When you looked and you see all the mechanic shops that line the roads, all of those mechanic shops are very, very in tune with internal combustion engines. But if you were to drive a Tesla there and drop it off to them, anything outside of change in windshield wipers and, and light bulbs, it is now a different skill set that is needed to work on an electric car versus your your traditional, you know, Chevrolet and Ford that exists as an internal combustion engine. So that is even a a better and more thorough um, explanation of the impact of this new technology, Mister Dinkins. That was a fantastic uh, opportunity for us to uh, to share in that. Anyone else like to share a little something? Yeah, me too. Agree the. Uh statement but the thing is it makes the people lazy they don't use <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah they, they don't use what we are doing now the new generation that is coming up they will be not using their brains which is the natural technology that the 
Almighty given us, the thing is they have to use that too. Yes, that is very true. Now, we had a, a, a recently we I had the opportunity to sit in on a presentation, and the guy asked us to add up four different numbers. He gave us four two-digit numbers that we were to add up. And, uh, of course, while we're sitting there, not, not everyone had their pencil and didn't have paper with them. So most people pulled out their cell phone and they plugged the numbers into their yeah. their calculator real quick and came up with an answer. So uh, the ones of us that did it on paper, let's just say the answer was 1,000. So some of us did it on paper, we came out with 1,000. The people who did it on calculators came up, they got 1,000. So the question that he asked from that point is, which one of us is more correct? Am I more correct because I used pencil and paper? Are they more correct because they knew how to use a piece of technology to come up with the same answers? Now, I hear you. Was one group being lazy while one group was working hard? Potentially. But at the end of the day, there's the, the speaker in that particular instance was saying that the technology has changed because now you have access to something that you could use to help make you lazier <laughs> you can or to help make you more efficient as they put it um, so does the utilization of technology really change the ability to get that answer i'm a, i'm on the fence about that one i feel i still think we have some uh we have some some searching to do on whether or not that's a true statement but that being said there is in fact um uh, technology that will make students lazy. Chat GPT is a good example of that, provided we don't leverage Chat GPT on the front end so that the kids use Chat, B G Chat GPT on the back end. So we'll we'll talk about that, but those are some excellent. Uh, Ms. Bowers, did you have anything you wanna add to? She right. can, she cannot hear you. Ah, oh no, uh oh. She, um, um, she said, I have my audio on. Check to be sure I'm still unable to hear. Oh, no. Um, let me, t I wonder if I could put up closed captioning for her. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, I was chatting. I was doing a direct chat to her. and. Yeah, I don't think I have the option to do it from a, from a, from a co-host standpoint. Okay, oh. let's see where I can do it. Um, I was able to hear Miss Octavia on, uh, it sounded like she was on her keyboard. I could see where her audio was registering. But um, I tell you what, we'll, um, if I have to, I'm going to reach out individually to Miss Bowers and I will, uh, I will make sure that not only she gets a copy of this, but I'll follow up with her individually and make sure that she gets everything she can out of it. Okay. All right. I was just checking. If I find it, I will do it. All right. Thank you, madam. Mm -hmm. All right. So I, uh, I'm glad the two of you, uh, who responded back agreed with what, uh, that statement says, because I'm going to go and explore some of those major technologies and we'll talk about some jobs that came out. So way back in the day, there was this guy, Eli Whitney made a cotton gin. Well, that one invention that resulted in textile mills, which is really the foundation of most of the eastern United States. Uh, they started making clothes. If you have clothes, you need clothing stores. Uh, now that you have Walmarts on every corner, you, now you need different fashions to come in. Um, all of that came about as a result of that technology. Further than that along, we came out with a telephone. Alexander Graham Bell gave us a uh, uh, a, a magnificent piece of technology. Now we needed people to run the lines. We needed people to run the switchboard. Uh, a whole business of over the phone solicitation happened. Uh, we are now able to expand our businesses from one side of the country to the other side of the country with this technology. You know, going back to electric light, power plants and the power industry, electrical engineers, you, you look at Las Vegas, it wouldn't be around if it wasn't for extra light or electric light. Uh, we can do the same with uh, a lot of the different major technologies. Um, the airplanes made so much be able to happen when it comes to expanding overseas. You have National uh, Transportation Safety Boards, which is a regulatory agency who looks over airplanes to make sure that they meet a certain standard. Obviously, you have pilots and stewardesses and airports and all the parking attendants that come as a result of that and all of the, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, computers even was more widespread than that. 
And then when you combine computers and internet, it really exploded. So um, the the fact of the matter is, yes, this is a uh, technology that is on par with the ones that you see here. And as a result, there will be a significant amount of jobs that are going to rotate around the power that AI is going to bring to the table. For example, AI trainers, who is, and, and kind of what I've been talking about this whole time, who is going to help provide the, the data sets that AI is, is monitoring, that it is pulling its data from? Um, there are going to be a developers and engineers because every website that you go to is going to have a layer of AI helping you, whether it be help desk or whether it be billing and receiving. It's going to have AI replacing some of those workers for those more uh, remedial tasks. We talk about policymakers. You're going to need people who are in the know in our government helping to govern what AI is capable of doing, what it's not capable of doing, how to police it, how to fund it. Um, medicine is taking a strong turn towards AI because it is able to view all medical documents and all cases that exist in all of the medical papers and be able to identify potential um, diagnoses from that. You talk about lawyers. Um, if you're in a criminal case now, you better understand how to triangulate someone's cellular uh, data to find out what their locations were. You better be able to uh, look at electronic transfers of when different communications happen and what someone maybe tried to delete off their computer. Um, cybersecurity, I'm talking about bigger than just phishing attacks. I'm talking about someone someone literally breaking into your system and stealing your stuff down. I hear a little something in the background. <laughs> um, so AI is going to make a huge change in what it is that uh, the job market is going to look like. When we look at a snapshot of today, the fact of the matter is three quarters of the people in jobs today don't feel like they have enough literacy in digital skills to be successful. Um, that is that is our customers telling us something that is in black and white. Three quarters of us who have gone through your K-12 system don't feel like we have what we need to be able to perform in my current job. And it's only gonna get more and more digital first. So again, let's listen to our customers and let's give the customers what they need, what they're asking for. They're asking for more digital soft skills. They're asking for more computer science and in, in, in my humble opinion. <laughs> so we now let's talk about lessons that we can learn from. When I think of social media, these are the lessons that I think we should learn from. There is an importance of a regulation. I'm, I'm not traditionally big on uh, things like um, censorship. I'm not big on, um, I think freedom of speech is a great thing. So I'm not talking about regulation coming to what is produced. I'm talking about importance of regulation as to the training of these softwares. Um, are we making sure that we bring hate speech out of this? Are we making sure that misinformation is held to a uh, a, a very, very limited amount. Um, how do we police that? How do we regulate that? Again, if you have people in Congress who are clueless on what AI really can do and what its, uh, what its position for the future is, they're not going to be able to make intelligent decisions going forward. So there's an importance of regulation and there's an importance of us making sure that our students coming into public service understand the uh, implications of computer science. There is a huge need for transparency. Social media had hidden algorithms that targeted certain people for certain things. It allowed certain um, news feeds to be more accessible than others. Uh, it allowed certain things to be on the front page while other things were put on the back page. We don't know what the user data is going to actually be used for. You know, one thing I find mighty um, scary is 
there is DeepMind, which is part of what is going into the Google side of AI, where they're using all of the Google data that has been utilized. So all of our documents and all of our presentations that we've made in Google, all of the emails that we have received and sent, all of the searches that we've done, all of that is going into utilization of their training model. So there is a lot of user data being used in these trainings. So the need for transparency, let us know what our user data is doing. Let us know where it's stored. Let us know who can access it. Um, and biases are a huge problem. You know, in the most general statements, let's just say left and right. You know, if, if it's trained on a left wing or a left facing media channel, then they're going to have a, a set of, of outputs that will basically have left leaning data associated with it. If it's a right wing uh, trained AI, then obviously you're going to have more things uh, from that right wing. So there is going to be a bias that is associated with this. We need that to be as minimal as, pop, as possible. The third thing and what I believe is the most important is the importance of education. People need to understand up front, this is the product. The product is social media. I need for you to understand that it will manipulate you. It will find out what it is that you like the most, and it will continue feeding you that information. You know, the unintended consequences on mental health is something that we see huge. The cyberbullying that happens, the, the connectedness came with some unintended consequences. Again, if we potentially could have uh, incorporated more awareness on the digital citizenship piece, potentially we would have bypassed some of those unintended consequences and the after effects of that on a generation of students. So I like to look to the experts. And when I look at the experts, I think of those who are very successful in their respective fields. So Morgan Stanley, one of the biggest financial groups, the CEO, James Gorman, says the digital skills are the new literacy. There is as important to him as English. Just as everyone needs to be able to read and write to be successful in today's world, they will also need to have digital skills to be successful in tomorrow's world. So he is saying that the the transition from reading and writing needs to go over to digital skills as well and marry those two things together so that you be successful today and tomorrow. And then our co-founder of Microsoft, Mr. Bill Gates, the future of work is digital period. Students who don't have digital skills will be at a disadvantage. It, it doesn't get plainer and simpler than that. So if we take the advice of these two strong people, let's either agree or disagree on these statements. Do we think that digital skills can help students be more productive and more efficient? You can just give me a little thumbs up in the screen if you think that that is an agreeable statement or a thumbs down if it's disagreeable. So do you think they could be more productive and efficient if students have digital skills and, and they are, they learn their digital skills? I think yes. Our second uh, statement, digital skills can help students become more creative and innovative. Again, I think thumbs up. Thank you for that. Digital skills can help students to communicate more effectively. Fantastic cooking with gas. Now, digital skills can help students collaborate more effectively with others. Yeah, I'm still getting thumbs up. I love it. Digital skills can help students to solve problems more effectively. Again, there is not a statement on there that I don't think not only affects them for their future, but let's think of students today. In your classroom with your students, would you want them to be more productive and efficient? I would think so. And you want your students to be creative and innovative and be able to communicate and be able to collaborate and be able to critically think and solve problems. That is going to be helpful in every single class that they will ever be in. So my question is, why do we only do this on an occasion? Why do we only get 15 minutes of time in a media uh, special? Or why do we have one teacher that has a going to try to get as much digital skill instruction to as many students as possible. It's too big of a mountain to climb in five-minute intervals. So 
hopefully what we will start to see is the incorporation of digital skills building and the instruction that takes place in the, let's call it the general classroom, the, the reading, writing, and arithmetic, and incorporate these and get a double dose at the same time. We'll double dip, we'll get a little extra. And that way, for those of you who teach computer science, you can start with the more high, uh, the more skilled, the more complicated things like the coding, like the uh, uh, the the critical thinking skills. Um, there, there is a, there is a lot of avenues that we could go down where they would be uh, more suited to someone who has a strong computer background, but eighty percent of it could easily be put of what uh, put into the average classroom. So this is getting back to what Ms. Samesh said earlier. AI will either be a shortcut for students' critical thinking, or it will be an incredible sparring partner to strengthen them. What actions should we take and can we take to ensure that it is the latter? So that is one of our uh, members of the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, Mr. Bill Cassidy. He is saying what you said. It's either going to make them lazier or it's going to sharpen their saw so that they can, again, using Stephen Covey, sharpen your saw is one of the uh, habits of highly effective people. The sharper that saw is, the more you're able to cut down trees. So leveraging AI in the classroom, let's talk just a little bit about that, how you could utilize AI to benefit your students. And it all comes down, in our cases, about prompt engineering. So have you ever used ChatGPT? Any, anyone here on the screen? Are you familiar with ChatGPT? All right, so Mr. Dinkins, Ms. Mesh, have you had an opportunity to utilize it? Yes, I tried one time. Not one time, actually, several times. Okay. Well, there is a, they're getting better. That's first. Um, but it's all about how you ask AI what it is that you want. So I've got a couple of, uh, of let's call them guidelines, guide rails. And then I actually have a way that you can write a prompt uh, to give that. And we'll explore that a little bit. So first, be as specific as possible. If you can give it more information, your results will come out better. Um, the second thing is concise and clear language. Uh, if we use jargon, if we use uh, things that are maybe specific to educators, the AI model might not pick up on that. It, it don't understand a PLC. It, it thinks a PLC is a programmable logic controller. It's not a professional learning community. So we want to make sure that we avoid using that jargon. Uh, and then we want to provide examples to help it understand what we're looking for. Now, that's kind of... That one seems obvious, but for, if I'm asking it for a parent letter, um, a parent letter to my students is one way to ask it, but I have a sixth grade student who is really acting up. I need to contact his parents, which are never uh, interested in his schooling, but they need to be aware because I'm going to recommend he be tested. If I provided all that to the AI model, it understands what it is I'm asking for, and it will help word the letter to all of the criteria that I laid out right there. But all that was kind of, you know, just speaking out. So let me put it in a, an easy algorithm, if you will. So if you have ChatGPT or Google Bard or any of this information uh, available, you can use that. I'm going to pull... Um, I'm going to pull Bard over. So Bard is, um, hang on, first, I'm going to pause real quick. I'm going to actually copy this down. I don't have to retype it. And I'm going to move a blank tab over here for us. All right. I use BARD. Uh, BARD is Google's AI, and I just use it because I don't have to go through an extra login step. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this formula for BARD. I'm going to tell it to act as a role. I want you to act as something doing a particular task in a format using a tone 
with a goal of this objective, but maybe not this. So that's kind of confused. And so what I've done is I've actually written it out. Act as a sixth grader. So that's my role. I'm not only a sixth grader, I'm not sixth grader. I'm sorry, I'm a sixth grade teacher. So that is my role. What I will be doing is creating a parent letter. That is also the task and the format that I want it. I want it in a letter and the task is a parent letter. Using a friendly tone, so my tone will be friendly, with a goal of an objective, with the objective of meeting with the parents to discuss their son's behavioral issues, and, but not to restriction, on any day but weekends, Mondays, and Fridays. So really, I could have just said just Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but instead to use the restriction, I don't want it on those days. So if that was what I actually wanted, I can come directly in BARD, and I'm going to paste that particular, she's uh, um, about to call it a quote, it's not, that prompt. And then I'm going to push enter. And BARD is actually going to take that, and it is going to create dear parent's name, right? It's express my concern about your son's name behavior in my class. He has been disruptive, disrespectful, and off task. It's unacceptable behavior and it's having negative impact. All right. That one is a little too punchy for me. So I can actually ask to refine that. Um, please make it shorter and friendlier in tone. I will write that and it will rewrite the letter it just did. And hopefully this time it will return it back to me. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Now it's instead of he is not staying on task, he's been talking out of turn and interrupting the lesson. I know he's a good kid. I'd love to meet with you. So he gave me two different drafts and what it's actually training itself on right now, which one of these drafts do I prefer based on the criteria that I said of making it more friendly and shorter from the original prompt. So it is learning right now. This is part of the AI learning part. Um, whenever a large language model generates something and sends it back to you, it has no knowledge of what it created. It just looked at thousands and thousands of examples of previous ones, and it predicted what the most effective next word would be based on all the drafts that it has taken a look at. So in a very short time, you are able to create a very unique parent letter that meets the needs, hopefully, that you can at least use as a jump off point. So in, in uh, a thousand different instances that we could replicate AI's ability to produce us something cool, um, let's think of it in terms of what might be a little more, um, I'm going to continue with A, why not? All right. Let's say, for example, that we have a that same student um, who really likes things dealing with music, but he just he, he won't engage in our content. So I want to make a particular lesson for this one student. I want to individualize the lesson for him. So I may say, create an engaging lesson, teaching. Um, the periodic table for a sixth grade student that loves music but disengages when reading passages. All right. I've told Bard what I wanted. I've misspelled several words along the way. And it is going to go, and it is, again, for this one student, for that sixth grader who loves music, he doesn't like reading, we got to learn the periodic table, please help me, Bard. It is going to create a somewhat decent uh, lesson, but... To, this is a lot better than I probably would have created my first two years of, of being a teacher. Um, it tells where all the materials are, has a procedure, it has ways that you can differentiate the assignment, has a way that you can assess them, different variations of it. 
et cetera, et cetera. So there's ways that we can personalize learning by starting with the teacher, by creating something in um, in Google and Bard in this case, by creating the lesson, you really have the ability to take that same prompt. I'm going to take this prompt right here. I'm going to edit it this time. I'm going to say, make it where the student can use AI in their final product. So what I'm going to actually have Bard do in this case, I want to leverage AI. I want them to utilize AI in the creation of this. So the lesson it's going to bring out now is now going to talk about AI music powered uh, composition software. The kids are going to create a hook. Oh my God, I want to do this lesson. But this is at the end of the day, the students are going to share their songs with the class. Remember, I'm trying to teach this kid how to do um, periodic table. I know he has a history of not reading. I know he has a history of misbehaving. This activity may be something that changes the way that student interacts. And I'm teaching him a skill. So this is science, but I'm teaching him computer science at that same time. And I'm using AI both to help me create the lesson and have AI as part of the lesson's final product. To me, that is uh, an excellent opportunity for us to use AI in those roles. So I'm going to go back to the presentation, and I just want you to uh, hopefully, if you keep something similar to that little algorithm I have, act as, doing, in, using, with the goal of, but not that, you will have uh, a very, uh, a very laser-focused return to you in ChatGPT or the equivalent uh, other products. Awesome. So let's brainstorm some tasks that could be automated if we were as instructors to utilize ChatGPT or an equivalent program in some of our everyday tasks to give us more time to be with our students. I'll give you a couple We've already discussed parent letters. That was one of the things that we went through real quick. Uh, we are talking about creating engagement assignments. We kind of modeled that already. So some other things that I can think of, let's say I might have a student who reads at a, a lower level. What if I had the same article, but I had it written in different Lexile levels so that everyone could still discuss that article? yet they're going to have the opportunity to read it in a Lexile level that they understand. Uh, that, to me, makes for richer dialogue within our classes. So we can utilize AI to help us change things like a Lexile link. We can put any, um, any text in there and ask it, give us a summary. Give me a 400-word a summary on this entire book, and it can do that for us. And it can help students do that too, mind you, but we just have to ask better questions with those lessons that we give. Um, one of the things that I had when I was teaching that my students did is my students created a textbook every single year. I taught chemistry and AP chemistry in high school for uh, four years. And while I was teaching that, the the end product was a textbook that they created. And what they were able to do is give their textbook to one student in the class that was coming up next. So for example, if, if I had them first semester, then they could give their book to a student that came in second semester. And the second semester, people could give their book to someone who was coming in in my new class. So um, these books became valuable because they created um, all of the content, all of the study guides, and all the remediation for their book in their own. And that case, in that time, we were using OneNote, but it was technology in the classroom. It was teaching them a skill. They were learning chemistry, but at the same time, they were learning desktop publishing. They were learning summarization. They were learning the content, obviously, and they had the expectation that someone was going to benefit from the work that they're putting in other than themselves. So it really gave them that need to do it. So I think about those remediation study guides that they passed on 
from one uh, class to the other. Now they can make these study guides or mediation by creating excellent prompts within chat GPT. And at the end of the day, this is, again, this is Kevin's point of view. I am interested in the quality of knowledge that the students have, not in how they, uh, how they ascertain that knowledge. I do not learn like most people learn. I am uh, one of the people who extremely benefited from things like YouTube, because if I watch it, I do it while I'm watching it. I can do it every other time that I ever need to. That is my style of learning, if you will. Um, I can have a teacher tell me that if I would just read it, it's right there. You might as well have told me to go run around the building and come back, close my eyes and write random letters down because that is my attention span when it comes to reading, unfortunately. But I can watch videos all day long. So if we have to turn something from text into a comic strip or text into a small movie, it is okay to do that. Uh, AI can help us with that. Creating lesson plans. Uh, those are some other things. That, oh, I'm so sorry. I hit the button one too many times. Um, and lesson plans or some other things. But if you can come up with something else that I can add to this list, I would like to continue to grow this list. If you could think of some other tasks that as an instructor, you could utilize the AI for your needs as well. Is there anything you can come up with? Yeah, this is, uh, I would never have thought to do this. I'm not going to take credit for it, but we were actually having one of those um, parent engagement events uh -huh. where we were met at the school and then almost like reader sweepstakes, we went out and visited families. If, if, they, if, they, if they were reading, they got a pizza and some sodas and stuff. Wow. And in, in the past, we would, I, I would, I, you know, when I was a teacher and they would give me the path, I'd say, we just passed right by that house and came right by it and four times and it was like the fourth stop. So we asked uh, the chat GPT to give us the most effective route to visit these four homes. And then, then so we had actually mapped out how to get to the first one and then to the, to in the most efficient way. So you weren't backtracking right. your, your attendance zone. That is brilliant. You know, imagine doing that for buses. Yeah. Oh, wow. I know that, uh, again, when I was in the district level, I was uh, assistant superintendent of curriculum instruction. And one of the things that we would do on a regular basis is we will go in and audit our budgets. And when you see how much money is spent in transportation, imagine what you could free up in your district just by, you know, a quick activity like that. That is brilliant thinking, Mr. Dinkin. Um, may I have your permission to use that one in my state conference? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. Um, I will be, uh, matter of fact, if any of y'all are planning to be at the SEAET, um, that is the Ed Tech Conference that is going on next week in Myrtle Beach, if any of y'all are, are attending there, we'll have a booth, and I would like to cordially invite y'all to uh, uh, one of our customer appreciation nights. So uh, if you're going to be in that area, please let us know. We have a dinner at Rios one night. We have a dinner at Top Golf one night, um, along with some food and beverages. So do want to uh, make sure that we show our appreciation for you and get a chance to uh, connect while we're in person. So I'll put that out there as well. Just send me an email, kcombs at learning.com. We'll take it from there. Awesome. All right. So let's was really talk about, again, when we look at workforce readiness, when we look at the end in mind, uh, we want to talk about how we can use computer science and artificial intelligence in industry today. What are some things that the different industries that our students are being trained for are using that? So if you have students who are interested in going into healthcare, um, AI is and computer science is actually in the process of developing new drugs, running new DNA sequences, looking at RNA, MNA. Um, they are, are looking for ways to do gene therapies, and all of this is being modeled within computers. So healthcare uh, is now utilizing many, many more computer science folks than maybe they're even using uh, people like nurses and, and pediatricians um, because they're able to affect a much bigger group of folks in a much shorter period of time. They're using it to diagnose diseases. We touched on that a little bit earlier and figuring out ways to provide a personalized care, much like we want a personalized learning path for our students. 
you know, no two people heal the same or have the same body intake or or metabolize drugs the same. Um, being able to utilize things like AI, it can help identify those things that I might be allergic to and and alternate medication uh, regimens that might provide uh, a better outcome for me. If you're talking about in the finance sector, in the business sector, AI can detect fraud. Uh, it can analyze all the data in the market and make strong and, and well-positioned decisions on financial um, investments and just automate the tasks of doing things like balancing your checkbook for you and uh, things that you're um, uh, you know, like, like your regular CPA used to do for you. Everything you do is becoming more and more online, a lot less things we're doing in cash. So there are always a digital paper trail of everything that you do. AI can pull all those digital trails together and help you with your taxes and your investments and your budgeting, et cetera, et cetera. It can even find things that you're paying for that you don't even realize now, like seven Netflix uh, subscriptions from all of the free trials that you've done. Um, and then you also look at things like retail, which a lot of our uh, high school graduates go into. Now AI can personalize your shopping experience, recommend products, and deliver it to you at your door for you to try on and send back what you don't like. Um, for those who are still brick and mortar, it's going to be able to manage your inventory for you. So now you need less managers. Um, again, we're looking at a lot of this being a decline and the number of people in those positions that we're familiar with today, but it's going to increase a lot of new jobs that are going to take its place and allow it to go and propagate faster. Um, and then you look at the, the last one, which truly is the area in which I believe the most people will be affected, and that's in manufacturing. AI will automate production processes. The quality control will be much better. Uh, it can better predict demand. It can understand weather patterns and how that's going to affect the supply chain, et cetera, et cetera. I'll give you uh, a personal example of not AI, but automation. Uh, when I first came out of college, uh, my degrees in chemical engineering, I was very big in textile engineering. Uh, again, for the Southeast, it was an absolute gold mine back in the early 90s. Uh, you had huge huge spinning plants and yarn plants and weaving plants and they had lots of business but when you would see a, a new automated spinning loom come in what used to have 15 people down this long hallway they were now able to do the same amount of output with a with a much smaller footprint than the the long long lines of people going and changing out bobbins so i've seen manufacturing take a downturn because of automation and then further you know we had uh trading uh wars that produced a cheaper product that was produced out of the united states so i went into education because of the the implosion of the textile market so i've already seen personally something that I trained for and I trained very hard for, it became non-existent for the most part after a short period of time after I graduated. So I had to be very, very fluid in what it is that I was willing to learn. Luckily, computer science tied in very strongly with what it was that I did in computer science. The opportunity to teach uh, with uh, North Carolina schools uh, allowed me to then bring in technology and science and then my love for stem and computer science fostered from that all right i don't know i don't know how this turned into an all about me thing but uh i did want to share that but i have seen this happen firsthand and luckily i had the support the finances and the skill set to be able to reinvent myself i don't know that we're going to have that same ability for all of the students that exist in our buildings. And I want this for everybody. So my my new passion. All right, so going forward, this is what, again, Kevin Combs' suggestions would be. Familiarize your students with computer science every day in every lesson in every subject if possible. It can help them in, in, in each one of these and it will develop those skills on computational thinking, and solving problems using the best resource out there. 
and that is the connectivity we have with the internet. So we want them to utilize their problem, or we want them to utilize technology to solve those problems. They are essential for jobs now. You need those computer science skills. If you learn computer science in K-12, there is a high correlation that you will have more success in college and in their careers. And finally, if you let them practice in everyday assignments, they're going to be able to take those skills into their everyday assignments of their jobs that they have once they are in the workforce. So with those three things in, in mind. Kevin, can I ask a question? I would love for you to. So, and you may be on the way to doing this as I see a Venn diagram come up. So with the computer science skills, I've heard lots of different programs and teachers and presentations list different uh, so those skills. Yes. You know, our students think the skill is, you know, being able to find something on YouTube. Yes. And so, you know, what what exactly is, and maybe you'll define it in the presentation, and if so, great. But, um, you know, what are the basic computer science skills needed? And if you want to keep going, that's fine. And I'll yep. just throw that question out there. I'll tell you what, it is the next piece. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. But, hey, uh, I love to see that we are on the same wavelength, my friend. That is awesome. So, yes, I'm going to address that particular question for the remainder of our uh, of our time together. And that is really when we talk about computer science, immediately people think coding. I'm thinking of writing this this gobbledygook that means nothing but to those people who are trained in computer science. So I am going to expand on that quite a bit. Computer science and digital literacy are two pieces. They are two sides of the same coin. The computer science really focuses with understanding the operation of a computer, how it works. Uh, that is create eating the stuff that makes the computer do something that is impactful for us. Digital literacy is how we use the computers. Like Mr. Dinkins was just saying, they, they think logging into YouTube is computer science. Well, they're using computers to do those everyday tasks, but what we're doing is giving them skills to do that better. So we're talking about things like improving their keyboarding speed, um, knowing how to use the internet efficiently with with search skills and understanding how to utilize AI with uh, with prompt engineering. Uh, we teach them things like creating PowerPoints and, and business applications or editing photos and movies. So we're taking away from what Mr. Dinkins was saying was being consumers of technology into creators of technology. So when we look at digital literacy and computer science and we smash them together, what we want to see is a student being able to create what it is they want to see the computer do because they're working on it every day and they are not just consuming someone else's work. So really we can fundamentally say moving students from the needle of consumers to creators, that to me is computer science. And this is how we accomplish it. We want early education. We want the students in a young grade level to know how to use the devices they have. We've given them the devices. In a lot of cases, we've given them access to the internet. And in the very near future, uh, and, and something I hope to share with y'all uh, in, a, in a short period of time is ways that we can get access to every student all the time through internet with uh, another program that we're working on with the state of South Carolina. But that being said, you have the devices and you have the access but we haven't really given a, an instruction manual to them. We assume they know what they're doing, but we don't really know. We thought they knew what they were doing when we introduced social media to them, but huh. they really didn't know. So knowing how to use the devices, and then we want to make sure that they're a good digital citizen. That is part of the using devices. What is appropriate? What is not appropriate? What is uh, considered mean? What is considered nice? Um, oversimplification, but I think you get the, the picture of that. And then finally, we'll go to the middle where we begin creating. We're starting to use those tools and those applications so that when a student is in a science class and the teacher asks them to make a presentation about igneous rocks, they know the skill set of creating the presentation. They can focus on the content. That's what we want teachers to have that available to them. And then we're going to leverage the power of the internet because that's where so much information resides. And then finally, connecting that last piece, that is the 
part of computer science where we really start needing professionals in our buildings to help with that because coding is something that there are so many avenues that a, a child can go from a, 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 a kid to tossing a rock in the middle of a lake those ripples go anywhere and everywhere and that's where a student's imagination takes them on one of those ripples in different directions the task has a multitude of ways in which they can accomplish it that's giving student, students choice and voice in their uh, assignments and that ownership right there is going to increase engagement in your activities from the very beginning i can almost promise you that one so another way that we can put this information down in a more digestible is easy tech so you were saying there's many programs and all that exists. I'm representing learning.com. So I'm going to share with you learning.com's stuff because it is the adopted one for the state of South Carolina and it is paid for. Um, so Easy Tech does exactly what I was just saying. We take your K through your eight student and we expose them to computer science and, and digital skill building so that two things hopefully happen. One, they develop a passion for it and they're exposed to it prior to getting into those grade levels in which they really have to make a decision about which track they want to be on. Um, I'm sure y'all are very familiar with CTE and how CTE works, that when you get to your high school, you can take a computer science track or a healthcare track or a manufacturing track. So once you're in one of those, you've kind of made your choice and you're going to stay in there. And you really don't explore out of that too much because there's so much involved in each one of those tracks. Well, the problem that I have with that is if I've never been exposed to real computer science and I get into high school and I know that that's very difficult and I know it's a, a subject that I might not do that well at and my friends are taking manufacturing, I might go into the manufacturing track and bypass this very fundamental computer uh, pathway, whether it be IT or whether it be computer science that I've just ignored because I don't have the credentials coming into high school to do it. So we want to erase that. We want to give them the ability to be familiar enough with it so when they get to that point in time in their high school career, they can make a decision based on their interest inventory and not avoid it because of fear. So that being said, we're going to do those computer fundamentals and that typing, business applications, online digital citizenship, internet usage, and then finally finish that up along their path with intro to coding. That encompasses all of the digital skills that we talked about in this particular Venn diagram. We're doing the computer science pieces with the uh, programming. We're doing the digital literacy pieces with the keyboarding and the business application. We're getting the overlap where we talk about the parts of the computer and we talk about the impact on society where we start having those opportunities for a little bit of thought leadership. Um, and then we also talk about the safe online practices in the two. So we completely take care of both sides of that Venn diagram when we talk about our computer science instruction that we have available. Easy code is once we get into the computer sciences and folks are really uh, kind of in, I've made my decision, I want to get deeper in coding or in my school or in my district, we want to be known as the coding group. Easy Code is another product we have outside of the scope of the Easy Tech, which is provided for free. But this one really goes in deeply into block based coding and coffee script, which are two languages. Uh, and then finally, it gets into Python, which is the, the coding language uh, that is most widely utilized right now. And all of the certification and tests available are in Python. But we've talked about cybersecurity and game design, and we just continuously add computational thinking that mirrors some of the advanced mathematics that they're taking about this same time frame. We do it with these fun and engaging curricular items. Um, we could produce all this in-house. Um, Things like uh, data literacy, the fastest search in the West takes students on the little adventure in which two folks are dueling down with who can search for something the fastest and get the right return results. So they make it real fun. We talk about um, 
building stamina and speed in students' keyboarding. So we have games like Block Party with sight words that students can both get sight words from their teacher and learn how to type them at the same time. Um, there's just many different ways in which our kids can interact with the curriculum items that we have. Uh, we do have resources available for our teachers. For example, they can play the videos, and then you can have classroom discussions on it. We do have offline activities that you can print, um, and most of them follow a very, uh, a very linear path. We do give instructions. We give them the opportunity to practice. We let them apply what they've learned, and then finally we assess them on that. Um, we feel that we should. Uh, very closely watch the growth of our students because without that growth then obviously we're wasting time we also have this available anywhere anytime so it can be part of your classroom rotation it can be part of an after school club that you may have we use it a lot of times for rta camp the read to achieve camps it becomes part of that um, if you're in a school library or your school computer lab this can be the curriculum that you use as you teach data literacy and those other SIPA compliances uh, that you're required to do. And then, of course, you can extend that to learn uh, all the computer science standards for South Carolina. And then finally, we have an opportunity for the different types of teachers that might be in a building, how they have found ways to utilize learning.com in their particular role. Uh, we go everyone from someone who is hired to be a technology teacher to where you may have someone who comes in as a paraprofessional and manages your lab. Um, that person who is going to be a librarian or a media specialist who is going to see the students on a regular basis, but infrequently. And then finally, the last one being someone who is a middle school teacher. He has a technology course, and he uses it also for an after-school club. So many different ways that it can be infused. Um, again, I came from North Carolina. We used, uh, in our elementary schools, we used a framework called Daily Five. Um, if you're familiar with that, it's just a rotation in elementary school between several reading stations, but we substituted one of those rotations with a computer science rotation. Uh, and what we found for that was teachers had more opportunities to work individually with our students one-on-one -on -one who are struggling with reading by having less students come up and, and interrupt uh, because they were uh, authentically engaged in the learning.com platform, learning computer science, along with literacy which freed up the teacher to be uh, op the opportunity for them to have more individualized instruction with students. And finally, we do have in your learning.com uh, account an opportunity for you to go in in the self-paced learning in our online training center. And you can look at how-to videos and interactive practices. You can have resources available, like videos that you can show your students about the first day. If you'd like to give certificates of completion when things are over, um, you can go through these modules and you can get a nice little um, digital badge that you can put on your email signature. Um, but basically it will take you through uh, the the courseware that we have, the how to utilize it, and you can also use it for PLCs, but that is available in the help section of your account. If you go to help, you will just look for your self-paced learning, and once you view those courses, you'll have a lot of opportunity to become more familiar. I also want to make sure I put out there that we are not only free for our content, but we're also free for our professional development. We're free to come to your buildings uh, and do in-person instruction. Uh, we can come in and do a video for a big group of folks. If you have technology days, we can come in as a vendor for that. Uh, let us know where we fit in to your, your view of how this could be, uh, how we can get more students uh, exposed to this. And my job is to make sure that we make that happen for you. Because ultimately, this is what we want. We want our students to be future ready. It's kind of our mantra from the very beginning. We're going to start at the base of this, and we're going to promote digital literacy to our young students. Those are the computer fundamentals and the keyboarding and the online safety and digital citizenship. How we do it is listed on the right. Those are our products that will do that. Once they master the digital literacy, now they have the ability 
to become proficient in STEAM subjects. So they'll be successful in those courses that they're taking. We have easy code that can help them along with that as well. Excuse me. And then finally, at the top of that, we want them to graduate to that 21st century problem solver, have certifications, have mastery of that content so that they have the ability to work at those big companies, uh, those Apples and SpaceX and Meta. I'll also share this with you. South Carolina is poised to be the second Silicon Valley. The West Coast is coming to the East Coast. And the East Coast location is South Carolina. This is going to be a fundamental piece of the legislature's view of how to position South Carolina to be that second Silicon Valley. We are going to have a workforce of highly trained students proficient in STEAM and computer science so that these companies will have a diverse workforce that they can choose from, which is local to South Carolina. That is our end goal. That's beginning with the end in mind. And that's the trip that we just took together. We're getting our students there. The last thing I'm going to share with you is I'm a data person. And I don't like to do a lot of things if data doesn't prove to me that's correct. The studies that I have on the screen in front of you are from Peoria and Flagstaff districts in Arizona, large districts. <coughs> Excuse me. And we also did a district out of Indiana to make sure that we had as diverse of populations as possible. We looked at one uh, item, the number of times that a student in that uh, district launched learning.com. And what we noticed, the shortest number or the smallest number of launches is always on the left as we go across, as you see the lines get bigger and bigger and bigger. Those are more and more launches of the learning.com program. So I don't want to be as bold to say that learning.com taught these students everything they know. That is false. But what learning.com has shown to do with these users, if you utilize the program more, you get exposed to different ways to think of things. You get exposed to different ways in which you can research, different ways that you can present, different ways that you can create your responses confidently and efficiently. And you spend less time on worrying about the creation of your response than you do actually making that response. So we're attributing the stamina that they have in keyboarding and word processing to be able to get more thorough answers. We talk about the computational thinking, a different way of processing information. Uh, there is just so many ways that we can justify those huge growths that we're seeing. And these are the number of students testing proficient or above in these districts. And it is a correlation that repeats itself in every district that we've been in. We also would love to do a study on your district at some point in time. So this is something that we will want to replicate in our South Carolina districts as well. To me, computer science digital literacies are the foundation for success in that digital world. Learning.com would love to be along with you for that. Since y'all are already members, you don't need to do any scanning, but I will leave my email address and my phone number up there. If there is anything that I can do for you, whether it be uh, thought leadership, whether it be planning, uh, whether it be one-on-one -on -one opportunities for us to get together and dive deeper into the actual program, I welcome your email uh, or phone call. I have a calendar on every email that I sent out that allows you to take up any free block of time that I have. And if you claim it, it is yours. We will spend as little or as much time as you want. Um, this is not a job. This is a passion. This is a mission. This is a calling. Um, if I can help your students become more exposed to computer science, I think we're both doing them a big favor by getting them ready for what's next. And it's not going to cost you a dime. I don't want anything from you. I just want your commitment of time and effort, and I will help God what that plan looks like as well. So thank you for your time today. Thank you for your attention. I will stop in case there are any questions or any last thoughts that you might have. Uh, we'll take that opportunity to flesh those out. And uh, I'm going to leave out of here today with a good feeling because uh, 
I do appreciate your attention and your passion. I was, I was watching your heads nod on some of the things I was saying, and that's just excellent feedback. Thank you for that. Um, but any questions you may have, I'll be happy to take them. Kevin, I have a question. Please. So when you showed that pyramid and there was a lot of digital literacy that was needed before, like the STEAM type yes. of creation. So if you, I'm at a K-8 school and I'm trying to think longitudinally, um, how would you phase something like in if the like the kids that might be older and maybe meant to, uh, mature enough to start computer science, but they yes. may not have the keyboarding skills? Is Are there ways that you can do some of the middle of the pyramid without completely doing the bottom of the pyramid oh. or, is, or is it recommended to go straight up no no absolutely so um and i'm, I'm gonna put my video back on now that we're kind of through presenting uh so to answer your question is at every grade level we do have we, we assume that a student is coming in without any of this so we will we can build them from the bottom to the top however there are the opportunities for uh, a, a teacher first and foremost to pick the curriculum that they want that student to engage with. So if I am a STEAM teacher, for example, but I see that my students are very poor at keyboarding, there is a program called adaptive keyboarding. In that particular case, that solution will allow a student to be tracked by the computer for where their weakness points are, and it will constantly reinforce those weaknesses with practices. That will that would allow them to gain that. If they do see that in the computer science piece where they're maybe introducing coding, um, but students don't have the ability to, um, let's say, let's say in the very young grades, they don't, don't have good mouth skills. Um, you know, that's something you'd expect, but you may have someone in middle school that's used their finger their whole time, or they've used a touch screen, and they don't know how to manipulate things or drag and drop and cut and paste and all that other stuff. So you can you can facilitate some of that learning um, from the business applications and the digital literacy piece to help them become more efficient in the STEAM proficiency. The beauty of it is when a, when a teacher starts assigning these, we have two different paths that they can follow. One is a completely auto-graded pathway, meaning that the learning.com software gives the instruction, gives the assignments, and then grades the assignments and gives feedback on those assignments automatically. Then there's a, another piece of it that will allow a teacher to have input as well. For example, uh, it's very easy for me to go through a vignette and a scenario and what would you do in this situation and these are the correct answers and fantastic, you did great. That's very easy to solve. But a teacher may want to have a conversation, so I'm going to put a problem. This person uh, said this and this person said this on the internet. Which one of these students was wrong? And I may want to hear some this group say this and this group say mm -hmm. uh, their version and then they have a Socratic seminar and come out with the basis. So there are times where you may want to have that teacher input as well. All of that comes together to build that STEAM proficiency. So there's a, even though it seems like you said a, a very longitudinal uh, building on each other, just to be great at STEAM proficiency, you must have the digital literacy skills. Now, we can help identify what some of those are, or we can actually leave a very open um, pathway, meaning once we assign work, it goes along a student pathway. So you may have 15 assignments that you want them to do. But we got 15 little stepping stones that they walk to to get to the next one. Well, you can leave it open to where, hey, I think I'm good at this one. I think I'm good at this one. I do want to take this one. So you can give the students the opportunity to kind of self-evaluate where their strengths and their weaknesses are. And they can maybe test out of some stuff or test into some stuff. You know, there are many different ways that we can overcome that. But the STEAM proficiency and digital literacy, they're so closely intertwined. The computer science is just that next step, that 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 rigor, if you will. Uh, we're taking digital literacy and adding some rigor to it by creating with code. So coding is really the piece that separates the digital literacy and the STEAM. But both of them come together where 50, I think 54% of the standards for South Carolina technology-wise are digital literacy standards, and only 46% have anything to do with coding and, and computational uh, uh, thinking. So even the, the standards themselves are set to where both of them are incorporated in the overall computer science.
So I hope that answers your question. It um, does. It does. At the end, at the end of the day, you can determine what they learn, and um, there is there is a way to filter that in. The kindergarten uh, lesson on digital literacy is going to be completely different than the fifth grade, which is going to be completely different than the eighth grade, because of not only the age levels, the reading levels. We take all that into consideration when we create those lessons. Yeah, Mr. Kevins, uh, I had a question about Easy Code. Mm -hmm. Is it available for us in learning.com with the normal account? So here, here's what I can share with you today. And I'm hoping mm -hmm. to share more at the conference next week. We have put in with the state of South Carolina to request to bring our Easy Code software into middle school um, because we really value that STEAM proficiency area right there. So we are providing that for middle school. The elementary school is still a, a separate uh, part of it only because we value the this pyramid. We need more digital literacy in South Carolina at the current time, then we need coding. We, we, we have to teach them to walk before they're running. Um, but we have a, a lot of groups that are, are walking pretty good right now. So we're starting to bring the running into the upper grades. The next uh, version of the Palmetto Digital Literacy Plan, in my hopes, is to bring it all the way down to elementary as well. So we have to we have to rely on lawmakers and lobbyists and all that to make sure that those things uh, happen. But what we can do in the meantime is we can continue using it. We can show that there is a need and a demand for it. Um, and and on occasion, I might even reach out for letters of support saying, "Hey, this is important stuff for, uh, for us as educators and administrators in our building. Thank you for not making us have to pay for it because it's not a cheap program." So. Uh, those type of letters are our currency with state uh, leadership. And I won't hesitate to ask for one <laughs> because that is, uh, it, again, it goes back to, I, f I find this is so important. This is the advice I would give my daughters. This is the advice I gave my daughters. <laughs> so um, if it's good enough for my daughters, it's good enough for every child in America. I think they all need the that same advice. And that advice is, Get yourself some computer science education because regardless of what you go into, if you're a lawyer, you are going to have to be able to explain in some computer uh, scenario of how a, a person is innocent or how a person is guilty. The, the due diligence that you're going to do, you're going to have to be very good at a, a technology device to be able to represent your client well. So if you're a lawyer, you need computer science. And if you're obviously working in a manufacturing, you're going to need computer science. You'll need to understand robotics. You're going to need to understand maintenance. All these things are part of it. So it's a uh, it's a big task, but I think we're up for it. And I thank you all for being part of it. I truly do. Thank you. If there is nothing else, uh, again, I'll, I'll put my contact information up one last time. If you have any questions or you need anything from me, if you will please uh, reach out to me. I am, with the with the exception of Ms. Rickenbacker, when I, I sometimes I take her a couple hours to respond to her, but I'm trying to get better about that too. So uh, <laughs> I, I usually will respond quickly. Uh, any questions you have, please let me know. Again, reiterate, training is at no cost. Um, it is in person or it is virtual. And we actually have one of your state leaders from Lawrence 55 providing some of the uh, training going on. Mr. Robert Shearer is uh, recently retired from Lawrence 55 and is given training uh, locally. So you have someone who has used it in their districts and used it very effectively in their districts to also help you uh, in, your, in your quest to bring computer science to all.